We have seen earlier that pathogens evade and suppress the immune system a variety of ways. Now we're going to take a look at how cancer cells do it. And I want you to think about what that means. Cancer cells don't have very much time to evolve. That means that evasion and suppression of the immune system is something that can happen pretty rapidly and in a variety of ways. And we should just expect that to be one of the things that cancers and pathogens both do. In, in the case of cancer cells, they actually have the same genes as the rest of the body. So they look like self. The immune system has a lot of mechanisms that make sure that it won't attack self. It won't attack healthy, normal cells in the body. Immune responses to cancer are an attack on self cells that have certain pathological characteristics. They have inappropriate metabolism. They are growing when they shouldn't be. They're moving when they shouldn't be. The immune system consists of sets of cells and each of those has specific functions. Those functions are coordinated by signals and those signals are interpreted by receptors. That means that if cancers want to evade immune responses, they are going to be disrupting those cells, they're going to be messing up those signals, they'll be blocking those receptors. Now those are exactly the same options that are used by pathogens. Most tumors are eliminated. Some survive but are kept under control and a few escape and progress to cancer. Elimination is done by recognizing that a cell is in an altered state and by killing both and by killing it. And that can be done both by natural killer cells, which are part of the innate immune system, and it can be done by T cells, which are part of the adaptive immune system. Some cells escape elimination, but they remain small. Those clones remain small. And that's because even though they haven't been killed off, they're still being kept under control. We can't clinically detect those. There are probably hundreds or thousands of such little clones spread all through our bodies. They're precancerous. Escape and progression to cancer results when the immune system either is no longer inhibited or no longer is either inhibited or no longer effective. And that happens either because there are mutations in the cancer cells or changes in the immune cell properties induced by the cancer cells. Here's how they disable natural killer cells. They're part of the innate immune system. They can react quickly to pathogens in the tumors without being primed by antibodies. So they're just recognizing some general characteristics rather than very specific characteristics of cells. They have a repertoire of receptors, and that repertoire is what ensures that they tolerate healthy self while allows them to react to pathogens and to cancer cells. These cells are major problems for cancer cells, and so if a cancer cell is going to evade or suppress the immune system, it's got to find a way around these. Here are some of the biological functions of natural killer cells. If you have a healthy cell and it experiences DNA damage or it's transformed into a tumor or it has a pathogen living inside of it, it becomes stressed. The natural killer cell can recognize it. It can either cause it to lyse directly, okay, so it can eliminate it by uh, attacking it and killing it, or the natural killer cell can then cause lysis to be picked up by a dendritic cell. The dendritic cell will present that to a T cell. The T cell will say, oh, here is a chunk of something inappropriate. Let's make, uh, let's recruit some cells to attack things that are producing that inappropriate stuff. And that will then cause interactions with macrophage and with other populations of immune cells. So the action of natural killer cells can either be direct or indirect, quick or delayed. 
Natural killer cells are covered with all kinds of receptors. They have activating receptors, inhibitory receptors, they have chemotactic receptors, cytokine receptors, adhesion receptors. They are a bundle of information processing. So it is these numerous different kinds of receptors that give natural killer cells the capacity for a precise and calibrated response. That's what keeps them from attacking self. And what's what allows them to recognize altered cells in either pathogens or in cancers and attack them. The natural killer cells, the NK cells, in the healthy state basically are inhibiting the, uh, they, they are detecting that they're dealing with healthy cells and they are being inhibited so that they won't try to kill it. However, you saw that big bank of receptors on the previous slide. And if we have a cell in an altered state, then in its altered say, state, it can activate the natural killer cell with activating receptors. It can, that can be done by shifting the balance, it either doesn't have as many of the inhibiting receptors or it produces a lot more activating receptors. Either of those can tilt the balance to activate the natural killer cell and it will swing into action to kill the altered cell. So basically what we see here are a variety of different ways that the balance in those receptors can work to make sure that on the one hand, natural killer cells don't kill self, but that they do kill pathogenic cells. Now, let's see how that might work in the case of one cancer, acute myeloid leukemia, AML. Here's the natural killer cell, here's a dendritic cell. Here is the cancer cell, acute myelitic, uh, myeloid leukemia, and here is a T, T regulatory cell. There is direct interaction between the natural killer cell and the tumor, and there is direct immunosuppression of the natural killer cell by the cancer cell. That is done by the production of specific identified factors. That leads to suppression of dendritic cell function, that leads to impaired stimulation of T cells. It leads to induction of T regulatory cells that then inhibit natural killer cell production. In that way, the cancer cell is interfering directly and indirectly with the signaling pathways in the immune system to downregulate the activity of natural killer cells and escape their normally deadly response. So at least three sets of immune cells are having their communications disrupted by the activity of the cancer cell. the autoimmune response can be subverted as well. So there are certain T regulatory cells that have a fancy name. They're called the CD4 plus CD25 plus T regs. They're important because they suppress autoimmune responses. So they're the things that are inhibiting immune cells that would attack self. Tumor cells secrete a cytokine, TGF beta, tumor growth factor beta, that converts minus T regs into plus T regs. So by doing that, they're taking a population of immune cells that would otherwise be mediating attacks on them, and they're converting them into cells that are ineffective. Basically, they are making the cells think that there's nothing wrong and that they are normal self rather than pathogenic self. So they evade immune surveillance. Neutralizing the TGF beta, the tumor growth factor beta that is derived from tumor cells, blocked this conversion. And uh, that meant that 
the Tregs remained effective in attacking cancer. So this is one point where therapy could intervene. However, notice how delicate this issue is. We would be interfering with a balance in the immune system that might inadvertently cause autoimmune disease through cancer treatment. So one would have to be very careful about how this was done and what kinds of tissues and so forth. Uh, it, it might look like it was safe, but it's one of those things where we're dealing with extremely powerful things that have enormous capacity to go in and to really mess up critical parts of our physiology. And it's another example of the sort of trade-offs that are involved in evolutionary medicine. Now, tumors are also changing their metabolism. And interestingly, they do so in ways that suppress the activity of cytotoxic cells and antigen-presenting cells. So cytotoxic cells would be natural killer cells or uh, killer T cells, and antigen-presenting cells would be cells like dendritic cells. Tumor cells upregulate glycolysis, and that lowers the pH in the microenvironment around them. So we're now talking about metabolic effects on local microenvironment. When that happens, the tumor cells are directly competing for glucose with glycolytic immune cells. So basically, they're sucking away the food supply of the immune cells. The lowered pH also interferes with the maturation and the activation of cytotoxic T cells and antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells. Thus, two hallmarks of cancer, the altered glucose metabolism and immune suppression, may very well be linked together. This is a picture of that process, and it helps to have a, a few of these acronyms defined here. So basically, you see the cancer cells are upregulating glycolysis and downregulating aerob aerobic metabolism. That actually induces angiogenesis because uh, arteries and veins are stimulated to grow into spaces that will need oxygen. And this is essentially creating a local environment that is signaling that it's not getting enough oxygen. The pH goes down, and uh, interferon is a cytokine. That's this cytokine here. It is dropping. The hypoxia-inducible factors are being upregulated. And vascular endothelial growth factor, that's this thing here, that's also being upregulated. So, this is all what is happening to stimulate angiogenesis. The upregulation of VEGF is causing an upregulation of myeloid immunosuppressive cells. Okay, so these are cells that suppress the immune system up to tenfold in cancer patients. What that does is it drives down the population of T cells. So this is a link between the kind of metabolism, aerobic or anaerobic, going on in the cancer tissue and the direct and indirect effects on the population of cells that might attack the cancer. Another thing that happens is that tumor cells downregulate the expression of MHC on their surface, but they don't, do too, don't go too far. They take it down, but they don't eliminate it. That's something that viruses also do. Some downregulation allows the tumor cells to avoid the adaptive immune response. It would be generated by cytotoxic T cells. Continuing to express a low level protects them from attack by NK cells. And this is what viruses use to avoid detection and destruction in some cases. So to summarize, most precancerous cell uh, growths are detected and destroyed by our immune system. Thank heavens. 
Some remain, but don't grow, and are not detected by clinicians. The ones that escape and progress to cancer have either managed to suppress or to evade immune surveillance. They do so by several mechanisms. They can disable natural killer cells. They can subvert the autoimmune response. They can modify their metabolism to interfere with the immune response, and they can downregulate the expression of MHC. Thus, cancer cells in many ways resemble pathogens in their ability to manipulate our immune system and to allow themselves to survive and to continue to grow in our bodies.